This is the Prestige M8, and it is quite simply the biggest and most expensive Prestige they've ever built. And we're here to give it the full works. In this review, I'm gonna give you a full tour, tell you what's good and what's bad, drive it, and of course, talk about pricing. So keep watching for a review with me and my big mate. I'm Jack Haynes, welcome to Yacht Buyer. It's quite difficult to give you a sense of the scale of this thing using just words, but to use Prestige's own Flybridge F690, their own Flybridge monohull as a comparison, it's five foot shorter than that boat, but it's 13 feet wider. The starting price is 5.2 million pounds, including VAT, but you're probably going to end up spending more like 5.7, 5.8 to an on-water spec, which is big money, but it's a big boat. And the name, the M8, comes because Prestige feel like you're getting the living space of an 85, 90 footer on what is a 65 foot boat. But we'll see, shall we? Let's have a better look around. Well, you really feel that width back here in the cockpit and it's beautifully open, it really is. This does feel like a proper terrace. This freestanding furniture, it's very beach clubby. You've got these day beds here. You've got this glass balcony that obviously opens up in the middle. It's got gates so you can close it to keep it safe. You've got boarding gates on both sides as well. But this is a fantastic vista looking out from the saloon over this infinity drop down onto the platform. And it's a very clever platform that Prestige have worked specifically with OPAC Mari to create because it's your bathing platform, it's your tender launch, it's got a 500 kilogram lift capacity, it drops right down into the water, it can align between the two outer platforms, obviously that's how you carry it when you've got your got the tender and it will come right up as well and meet deck level so it extends this cockpit a really useful amount. Separately you can have a passerelle as well so if you're mooring stern too you've got that option as a separate cost option but that platform which makes such a difference to this area that is standard. Not a huge amount of storage under furniture here, but there's a massive storage void underneath the deck here, and you can actually get to that via a drop down hatch in the transom. And that is where they expect you'll chuck all of your water toys. It starts at the transom there and it comes right up to this bulkhead here. So it's a huge space that you can put inflated stand up paddle boards in, things like that. And you've got access to that from this deck hatch. So putting fenders and things like that away is very easy. You don't have to go down onto the platform if you don't want to. Worth pointing out, you can enclose this whole area as well. There's covers so you can extend the living space if the weather isn't so good. But yeah, it's a fabulous, fabulous space. And as we'll see when we get into the saloon, the way it all connects is outstanding. But we'll look at that later on. Now this is one of two staircases that lead up to the flybridge. There's one out here, one in there. Again, we'll cover that a bit more closely inside the boat. But for now, let's stay here on the main deck and take in these enormous side decks. On the way, I'll just point out that you can have control stations outside here in the cockpit. So we've got one on the port side. You could have it on the starboard side if you prefer. I'm pretty sure you can have one on each side if you really want. That may be overkill, but again, well positioned here so you can really easily see the back of the boat. And then just look at these side decks. They are vast and they're really nicely protected as well. You've got this big piece of glass here. So you don't lose the view, but you just feel the security, the protection as you're moving forward. And look at the height as well and the quality of this stainless steel. This is really proper stuff. This is built at the Monfalcone Yard where they build or used to build the Monte Carlo Yachts Range. These guys know how to build big expensive boats and you can feel that here in the way this thing's put together. This is a boarding gate, got them on both sides. This clips up and then the door opens out really alongside it's sort of fuel pontoons and if you're alongside you know key sides this is not for pontoon access obviously we're very very high up here in fact it's pretty much impossible unless you're a giant to reach the cleats from the pontoon so you'll be doing a lot of the crewing from on board now here's a neat feature and this is a bit of a first for me certainly on about this size this is the day head not accessible from inside the boat but accessible from the side deck, which makes so much sense. This is the loo you use when you're covered in sun cream or your feet are wet. You have to go inside the boat, jump in there, and it's really easy access, very clever bit of design. The only thing they might want to do is shade this glass a bit, because uh, you can still see me in here, which, you know, that might be some people's thing, but uh, not everybody's idea of a bit of private time. 
So some work to do on the smoking of the glass. Carrying on forward, we have another side door here. So this gives you access further forward into the saloon. It is on the opposite side from the helm station, but again, it's just another really easy access point. And there's a couple more in there that we'll look at once we're actually inside. And you feel so safe and secure. Even as we go up to this higher deck level, look how far up the rails come up as well. So even though I'm perched quite high here, this does feel really lovely and secure. This boat's actually got synthetic teak. You can have real teak if you prefer, but God, it looks so good these days. It really is quite hard to tell. And this is another area where you're like, oh yeah, I'm on a power cat. Look at the sheer width of this thing. So they've just got so much space to play with. They've got a mix of just pure sunbathing space here. And this is an area that you're gonna to struggle to get on a monohull, certainly of this length, is this sort of sunken seating area. And of course, with the design of the cap, they can drop down between the hulls and really make the most of this area. So this is a really good sociable space. You can clip in some poles and a canopy here to give yourself a bit of shade, but this does become a proper socializing area when you've got this sort of seating down here. Now, like its little sister, the crew space on this boat, one is standard, it's 22 grand to have the other one, but these are little self-contained crew spaces like you have on the M48, apart from these are obviously a fair bit bigger. It's still not the ultimate luxury, but you have got a little bathroom down there, obviously you've got a berth, and if you wanted an extra crew cabin, you can put one in the engine room, which we'll look at later on. But that's where your, your crew are, and they are totally separate from the guests on board as well. So if you're looking at charter, then that's, uh, that's quite a benefit, obviously. Much the same over on this side. You've got windless access down here through a nice big locker that's centrally mounted. There's also storage in there, a good amount of storage. Quite a few fenders can be tucked in there. So that's quite a useful space. And then really, this is very much the same as on the port side. So I suggest we head up to the flybridge. As I mentioned, there are two access points to the flybridge, one inside, which we'll have a look at later, but this is the way you get up from outside. And this is another area where the space just whacks you in the face. So there's so much space here. It feels like it just went, oh, we've got some empty room. What should we do? I'll oh, just chuck a sand pad in there. I mean, back here, it's open as standard. The furniture option is, is 20 grand, but it does really just lend to that comfortable sort of villa beach club vibe to have some furniture back here away from the cover of the hard top this is a really nice lounging space obviously uh, you've got the hard top that's the standard the sunroof is an option that's about fifteen thousand pounds but again it really adds to the versatility of this area it allows you to open up the wet bar and the dining table a bit more to the elements if you want to. Quite a unique position of the wet bar here. You've got two, so you've got your cooking and sink and cooling space down here. And then this is just storage and a, a bit of a bar to arrange some drinks. But this is just really useful, empty storage space. They've got all the covers for, this, for the seats in here now. But again, they've got the luxury of space, so they can just do something like that. Nice table over here. Again, freestanding furniture. It doesn't really feel like boat furniture at all, to be honest. It's very classy and yeah, very flexible as well. It's nice that the furniture's not nailed down. There's not an issue really with stuff sliding around on a boat that is this stable. So they can do that. And you can enclose the entire flybridge with covers as well, if you want to. Some markets that's quite appealing, but today just having the flybridge, the sunroof, you know, nice and versatile and, and works very well indeed. One thing I should mention before we head downstairs is that if you don't want the sunroof, you can have silent mode, which is about 130,000 pounds, but it includes solar panels here on the roof and a big battery bank, meaning that you should be able to run the boat with all of its systems, including air conditioning overnight and probably for a few hours in the day without firing up the generator. And things like the air conditioning, they work really hard to make sure they're not using as much energy. They've got a new system that uses around a third of the energy of a traditional water a chilled system. So if you're really looking for, for silence and autonomy, that could be the way to go. We will talk more about the helm station out on the water, but I think now what we should do is drop down through this internal staircase and check out the main deck. Yeah, they really have the space on this boat to integrate a really nice internal staircase. This is all structural got it on both sides, but it's also 
quite quite pretty, quite architectural as well. And then you have the staircase set within it. And in terms of moving between decks, communication between decks, passing things up from the galley, that works really well. And then as you move aft, you have this really special connection between the saloon and the cockpit. They didn't want two enormous doors, so they've broken it up with this bar area, which also has this drop-down window. So that really does help with the connection. It helps with ventilation. You can stand that side, you can stand this side, you can serve people from either side. They were certain that they wanted a galley forward layout on this boat because they wanted this mix of socializing areas, but having this in the middle with the sink and the fridge and some storage gives you almost a mini galley here and it just sits perfectly on the threshold. It works really well and it means you haven't got two huge doors to contend with and you have two separate access points at the back of the boat, which works very well indeed. You've also got this access point here. This is standard sliding door here on the starboard side. I've pointed out the side door on the port side. So as I said, the points of access to this area are superb. From these two here, either side, and of course, from the internal staircase. Very, very good. And the feeling is very similar in terms of the look, furniture, color scheme. It's all new for Prestige, a whole new line, lots of blues, lots of light colors, stylish pin and freena furniture. It's absolutely lovely, and it does feel different to any other Prestige that I've been on. Now the television drops down from here. It's actually got the wrong TV on this boat. It will have a bigger one than the finalized product, but yeah, that swings down from here, and it can rotate as well, so you can angle it depending on where people are sitting. And you have a, a central bit of storage here. Again, it's one of those things where they have the space to do it, so they've put it there. But again, who's complaining about having more storage? And you can open and close the hatch up to the flybridge electrically, push of a button. It's not a hatch that pings open like a traditional flybridge hatch. Touch a button, it slides backwards. All very neat indeed. And this is a fabulous area here. This storage area really demonstrates the depth of the decks on this boat. The volume in there where you've got loads of storage, you've got the washer and the dryer all neatly put under the floor in the middle of everything so everybody can access it really easily. Obviously you've got your dining space over here to the port side and there's a real hum of quality for more of this stuff even down to the fine detailing and this is this does feel like it's been learned from building the Monte Carlo yachts boats. You know things like this you've got this latch here, you've got this slide out drawer, Everything's filled, your little Vilroy Bosch coffee cups, even the cutlery has got its own fiddles. It's really nicely done and it, and it feels like big boat stuff. This is an expensive boat, you expect that sort of thing, but it is executed very nicely indeed. Lower helm options, now as standard, you don't get any lower helm on this boat. They expect that most people are gonna do the driving up there, which they probably will. As an option, 45,000 pound option, you get this control station. So it's not quite a lower helm, but it gives you throttles, joystick, gives you repeater buttons, it obviously gives you an MFD and the Volvo instrumentation. It's good to have down here, it gives you a quick reference. I don't think you'll do much driving down here. A, a helm, a proper lower helm is a cost option. It costs more than this, where you get a seat and a wheel. But, you know, the view's okay. I just don't think even if you've got that, you're not going to spend a huge amount of time down here unless you're going to be doing lots and lots of night passages when you want to be tucked up and warm. And no, I think most people will use any excuse to be up there. But this is something that gives you, you know, at least a reference point down here and some control from this deck rather than having to go up the flybridge. But don't forget, you've also got the joystick and the cockpit as well. So there's plenty of flexibility and you can, you can fit that if you want. But again, most people will probably do without it. And then you have the galley right forward here. It's not huge. I think for the size of the boat, it feels a little bit smaller than you might expect. But the design is good. I really like the finish. I like the amount of storage you've got. This is quite clever. It drops down to the counter. It's basically the design of a coffee machine. It's got plugs in the back, but that just sinks out of the way when you're not using it. Touch of a button, up it comes again. Dishwasher is standard, but it's a little bit small. I say if you had a, the boat full of people, if every cabin was full, that would be working quite hard, but not such an issue with cooling space. Would you just look at this? Americans, are you watching? This is for you. Look at the size of that. Yeah, lots and lots of cooling space. Nice big double fridge, big freezer down here as well. Yeah, this feels quite liverboardy. You know, if you're gonna be on board for long periods of time, you've got really good amount of cold storage and Miele cooking as well. Again, just that sort of higher quality of component. You've got induction hob, and then you've got your microwave oven down there. And then we move on to accommodation where there's lots and lots of options. This is 
likely to be the most popular four cabin option with the extended VIP. You can have five cabins. You can also have the galley down. If you want the galley downstairs, crude boat, maybe that would be attractive. Personally, I think this layout works really well. Let's start with the accommodation and that extended VIP in the port side. Here we are then aft in the port side hull in the VIP cabin. And this is the extended VIP cabin. They'll be clear why that is in a second. Here though, obviously you've got the bed, your sleeping area. It's a very nice bed actually. And you've got good access on both sides. Nice big side tables, a bit of storage and light repeaters for the lighting all around the cabin. Obviously you've got individual cooling in each cabin. There's a screen on the wall. You can control your air conditioning from. Nice little bureau down here where there's some storage and crucially the bed is set at a level where it does align with the hull window so you can lie in bed looking out over the water. How very lovely. Behind me here you have a walk-in wardrobe, a little desk area, a bureau. It's really good size. Lots of space for bags and clothes and all of your kit for a nice long stay on board can all live in there. But what's really impressive about this cabin is this area here. You've got your own little lounge here in the VIP. So your guests can come down here, get away from it all. The TV's here so they can watch some TV. But yeah, this just has a real sort of suite feeling to it, like a hotel suite where you've got a nice separate living area away from the cabin itself. And if you have the five cabin option in this boat, you lose this and you have another cabin down here. But this is a very nice place to be able to house your VIP guests. What about the other guests? Let's go and have a look at the rest of the accommodation. So now we're forward in the starboard hull in one of the other guest cabins and you would mirror this on the other side if you had the five cabin layout. And it's quite a clever arrangement really because it's a small double so you could probably sleep a couple of kids in there. Obviously you've got space for somebody else up there, you can sleep an adult in this bed. So this is a flexible arrangement with its own ensuite. And then if we move aft, we're into what is pretty much an identical to the VIP on that side, apart from it's not got the extended bit. So this is what that cabin looks like without the extended living area that you have and the extended VIP. Again, very similar, nice high bed, which is, which is good and wide, comfortable, space up either side to get in and out of bed, that sort of really important view from bed out over the water. And as with the other VIP, a very nice, spacious, private ensuite. And one thing to mention about the bathrooms is this is another area where I think the look and feel is just enhanced over other prestiges I've been on. This isn't real stone, but it certainly looks like it. And this is a really nice effect here on the carrion countertops. You've got Tecmar toilets, you know, electric quiet flush toilets fitted as standard. Again, it's just that elevated feeling of quality that is where the boat needs to be at this price point. But down here, I've saved the best till last. Let's head forward and have a look at what Prestige calls the owner's apartment. Okay, that may sound like a little bit of silly marketing speak, but I have to say it's a relatively apt description for the sheer size of this owner's suite. They talk about having the space of an 85, 90 foot yacht. And well, yeah, this is the sort of cabin you'd expect to find on a monohull of that size. It is truly spectacular and some very interesting design decisions. They've moved the double berth so it runs across the hull rather than along the center line. Again, it's giving you that connection to the outside. That's what they're trying to achieve with all of this geometry but it is very effective and it gives you nice walkways down both sides of the bed. This is a huge bed, it's absolutely lovely and this is set much lower than the other cabins. So it has that home hotel room feel, really doesn't feel like you're on a boat at all. You can see how good the headroom is here. I am six foot tall and I've got plenty of space throughout and the floor is flat as well. So nothing to trip over on. This is a big storage unit here. I love this 3D effect you've got here on this cabinet you know there's lots of interesting tones and textures and patterns going on here it's it's intriguing and again they've they've worked in all of this structure but it's quite architectural you know that is a working bit of structure of the boat but it doesn't look out of place here in the cabin and this is set up as again a sort of lounging area you've got the tv here so that's more aligned to 
face the bed. You could probably do with a TV up here as well, facing the sofa. But if you wanted this to be a study, you can have a more sort of solid partition here so that it's a bit more private. If you wanted to put a elliptical machine here or something, you could put that here and turn it into a bit of a gym. So, you know, this is a production boat. This is Beneteau Group we're talking about, but there is flexibility when it comes to those fine details. But uh, no, this is a very special feeling cabin. This is all storage apart from in here where you have the all important beer fridge. And then if I take you this way past the bed, we have talk about having too much space to play with. They've just put a shoe locker in there and that's a cupboard just for your shoes, but they always need somewhere to go. And then over on this side, this is where we have yet more storage and the bathroom. And the bathroom is a clever arrangement as well because you've got a split shower and toilet, toilet one side, shower the other. So someone can shower while someone else is in the loo. And then you have twin sinks here in the middle, open to the cabin, but you've got a sliding door so you can close it off entirely if you want to. And then this is a very nice sort of big boat feature. Through the smoke glass door, you have a proper walk-in wardrobe. Yeah, this really is a special cabin. So that's the last of the accommodation. Let's go and check out the engine room. And here you can see another pretty obvious benefit to having a power cat of this size. First of all, this is a twin engine boat. And this one here on the port side has this entire space all to itself, apart from the generator, of course. And the ease of access to all of these points is just astonishing. And would you look at the headroom? There's so much headroom, in fact, that if you want the extra crew cabin, as one is standard, the extra one in the bow is an extra. You can have another one back here if you want. And they just build another level in here. And this becomes a cabin on top of the engine room. If you don't have that, well, this is just an engineer's dream. It is so easy to get to everything. You don't have to crawl around. You don't have to even stoop your head. It is pretty phenomenal, even with the generator in this one. The generator isn't on that side. You can have two generators on board. This particular boat's only got one. The finish is a little bit scruffy in the dark corners here, but this is hull number one. There are improvements they're gonna make throughout the boat. And I think the tidiness of this engine room is one of them. But in terms of the space, the space to work in, outstanding. Right, let's fire them up then and see what it's like to drive. One of the things that has come on leaps and bounds since the early days of Powercat is slow speed control. Of course, we have joystick control now. So all that pain of trying to move it sideways without thrusters and trying to use the throttles is gone. If you want to move sideways, you hit the joystick. The system uses the props and the bow thrusters to move the boat sideways. If you want to twist, it just uses the props. And if you want to use the throttles and the thruster independently, you can do that as well. The joystick just ties it all in together to make it as easy as possible and does make this boat, yes, it's wide, a bit intimidating at first, but incredibly maneuverable. And you also have cameras all over the place, so you can really easily spot where you are, spot how close you are to things. Even if you're downstairs where you haven't got a great view out, you can still very easily do it. And what you find with the Powercat is that really no matter what you do with the speed, not a huge amount changes. You know, there isn't much bow lift. It stays nice and level. You just get a little bit more wind pouring over the helm. It does make for incredibly relaxing progress. Now, the top speed of this boat is 20 knots and cruising speed really anywhere between eight and, and 15 procedures recommend. At eight knots, you're gonna get about 1400 nautical miles off a tank. It's got a 3,700 litre fuel capacity. At 15 knots, you're getting 350 nautical miles, which isn't huge. It's not gonna cover masses of ground, but then, you know, this isn't a sort of cross Atlantic type trawler yacht it is a leisure catamaran after all if you really want to extend the range it does pay to drop it down a bit but then again if you go flat out you still get 300 nautical miles so it doesn't completely drop off a cliff like you might find on a semi-displacement boat or a planing boat and i go back to that word relaxation it's all very serene it's all very comfortable the boat is incredibly stable and the point is you move more slowly but you can use the boat while you're moving along. Your guests can move around really easy and comfortably. The journey becomes part of the day. You're not just dying to get to your destination and get the anchor down. You can use the boat the entire time, which is something quite novel, really. It just feels so comfortable at those slower speeds. And it's a really great helm position. These lovely, comfortable seats. Yes, you sit back a bit and you're not that in touch with the controls, but honestly, it doesn't really matter. Even in rough conditions, you're not going to be on and off the throttle with this boat. You're going to just set the speed and let it cut through the waves. So you can just sit back and relax, put the autopilot on. You've got these 22 inch Garmin MFDs as standard. They're absolutely enormous. They're 
They're lovely, really nice to use. They present the information beautifully. You've got a separate Volvo screen as well, so you can always have your engine information running through there. It's really well set up for what it is. It's not designed to be engaging. It's not designed to be sporty, but it does turn quite nicely. It's designed to cover big distances very quietly and very comfortably. It's very simple when it comes to engine options because there's just one. Volvo Penta D8 600 horsepower on V-Drive shafts. Visibility forward is obviously very good. I've got a fantastic forward view. You can't actually see the aft end of the boat from up here, but then you have the suite of cameras. So you would rely on them if you were gonna berth the boat from up here. But then, as I've said, you've got the joystick down in the cockpit as well. So really, if you're doing stern two mooring, you'd probably get as close as you can from up here and then do the final bit of maneuvering from down there where you've got that really fine joystick control. I mentioned the handling, it's really not what the boat's about, but what's quite nice is that it's electric steering, so it's nice and light, and it feels like it's on rails, really. Obviously, there's no lean to speak of at all. It just stays completely flat, but it does turn nice and tightly. Within three or four boat lengths, you can turn back in yourself. So, okay, you're not gonna be sort of dodging around waves or, or just, you know, having a bit of fun chucking it around, but if you do need to change course last minute, then it does behave and react really immediately which is which is nice of course but yeah most of the time you'll just sit on the straight and narrow and let it get on with it if the m48 was prestige testing the waters of the world of power cat well the m8 is a full-on nosedive this is just a totally different proposition entirely and it's an incredibly effective all-round package and there are head turning features all over this boat from the way the off platform works to the size and the layout of that main saloon and that incredible master cabin and the sheer amount of space that you can enjoy all over this boat we had 17 people on board today and you could still find a little corner to have to yourself so if you have the 8 to 10 on board that this boat's designed to carry well then it's going to feel incredibly spacious and private indeed prestige as a brand is relatively new to the world of power cats but this model sets an impressive precedent for a booming genre thank you very much for watching that review of the prestige m8 please do let me know what you think of the boat in the comments below and if you want to watch my tour of this boat's little sister the m48 from the Dusseldorf boat show click up here and if you'd like to subscribe to the yacht buyer channel then please click up here thanks for watching